I'll try to get through this uh, as we get to, to the break. Um, as as uh, Sean mentioned, uh, this has been really great, and uh, hopefully you can see some tie-ins to many of the talks here, um, because there's a hydro period theme going on, and it looks like some more kids are uh, responding to that as well. So, um, got to talk a little bit about orchids. Orchid days, a lot of people don't know, but orchids are the largest plant family, questionably, only rivaled by Asteraceae, the sunflower family. We think almost 25,000 species um, estimated, so hugely diverse, and they occur everywhere. You find them pretty much everywhere but the driest deserts, whether cold or hot. And pretty much if there's liquid water, you'll find an orchid species. Really amazing. And not only that, they, they occupy pretty much every, every habitat, again, outside of those deserts. Um, another interesting thing about orchids, you get the full range of population abundance. So you have species that are extremely rare, like our ghost orchids, of course, um, both naturally rare and uh, human-caused reasons like poaching and um, habitat loss, logging, things like that that occur in this area. Um, but also you get things that are even now becoming invasive and weedy. So I just found, you know, you guys probably have all seen this, this African monk orchid that's pretty much invaded every upland habitat we have in southern Florida, uh, native to Africa. Um, it's kind of the dubious to history. It may have blown over on the trade winds, but um, either way, it's everywhere. So um, in addition to this little Yolofia, the another little terrestrial ground orchid, which is popping up. We'll talk a little bit about that today. And this is spreading quite rapidly through Florida. I think it's all the way up into north of Orlando now we're finding it. So with the, the warming trend, we expect this one to continue to go up, as well as some other little weedy things that we find. Um, but we really can't talk about orchids without talking about human impacts, of course, briefly, uh, whether it was the poaching, like I mentioned, in this region, uh, or, uh, you know, these are some of the star, uh, Darwin's famous star orchids, uh, Madagascar, which were poached. Uh, either way, there's a long history of human uses for orchids, whether in the East, when I spent time in China, it's very different. They collect them for traditional medicines versus here, it's more of an ornamental thing. Either way, humans have played a big role in uh, uh, reducing some of these natural populations. Um, and and uh, as a result of that, all orchid species are covered under CITES. So, so. Um, Florida, awesome place to study orchids, great. Uh, there's about 200, roughly 200 species in North America, uh, or continental U.S., you can think of it. Um, about half are found in Florida, and about a fourth are found just in this area right now. About 45 represent in Fagahatchee, which is kind of, I call it orchid hotspot in North America. So it's really an amazing place to to study orchids and uh, it's really a special part of the country and worth saving. So we can't really talk about orchid populations without looking into the life cycle. This will feed right into basically my core research into the fungal components. So um, orchids start as tiny dust seeds. So uh, these are unique in plants in that they don't have any endosperm. They, they lack an endosperm, so they have no nutritional kickstart to, to kickstart germination. They have no nutrient to jumpstart that germination process. So to get around that, orchids have actually um, uh, utilized fungi. And this is where the mycorrhizal component comes in. It's all 25,000 species of orchids require fungi to germinate the seed. And what we're finding, as more research goes into this, um, that this is often a very specialized relationship. So depending on what species of orchid you are, you use a certain group of fungi. And this is uh, the core of a lot of my dissertation work. Um, so if you do, so basically all these dust seeds, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, are flying around the air, randomly in the environment, in the hopes of coming in contact with just the right group of fungi. So as you can imagine, this is an exceedingly rare event and a very limiting factor, a bottleneck in the reproduction of organs in life history. So say they come into contact with, uh, with the right fungi, um, that very low percentage, low probability, they then germinate into a structure we call a protocorm, and uh, this is literally where the orchid will take up the fungi, and it will digest the fungi. This is really another really interesting thing with orchids, that this relationship's parasitic. There's no evidence that the fungi gains anything from the orchid. So this is not like a traditional mycorrhizal relationship we'll look at. So these are actually little predators on fungi. It's kind of interesting, another reason why orchids are so neat. Um, they make it past this, this uh, hurdle. They get in the seedling stage, we find that orchids are still associated with fungi, even in the advanced um, life stages. So some orchids have a completely different suite of fungi as a seedling as they do as an adult in a germinated seed. 
So it's very complex and again, very limiting, we think. And the reason why we see very small population sizes in natural organisms. So say you make it through all this, you become an adult plant, you're lucky enough to flower, maybe after 10 to 15 years in the case of the cow horn. You still, a lot of orchids, about a third are, are cheaters and they have very specialized pollination systems. Again, another enormous bottleneck for orchids. Um, so in the case of our cow horn, um, and cow horn, this genus, it exploits oil beads. So they dupe the bee into thinking it's an oil plant. And uh, so they offer no nutritional reserve, no, no nectar, no pollen. It's completely a cheater um, type of strategy. And so again, very limiting that this is a specialist bee, only comes out a certain time of the year during the flower period of this in our native oil plant. So again, a very, a very huge hurdle and bottleneck in life history. And then finally, hopefully you get a fruit, in the case of the cow horn, up to three million seeds. So really, really amazing amount of uh, seed production. So to the work in my crisis, we won't talk too much about pollination um, anymore, even though I, I do work a lot with the, the specialized pollination systems. That could be a whole other talk in itself. Uh, but we'll talk about mycorrhizae. Again, these are a special type of work in mycorrhizae, their own group of mycorrhizae. Um, they're now considered distinct from the other groups, our muscular, ectomycorrhizae, which are more commonly known. Um, but they are a special type of endomycorrhizae, so they actually do enter into the cell of the root. This is where um, they, for whatever rhyme or reason, we don't really know much about this, but uh, they'll, they'll stay as a healthy peloton. It's kind of what we call this hyphal coil. It's a jargon term. So these hyphal coils, they'll, the orchid will allow them to reproduce, almost fill in the entire cell sometimes. Very tight, packed hyphal coil. And then for whatever reason, whether it's environmental, we don't know the cue, it then just digests the fungi. And again, there's no exchange of nutrients. This seems to be a very parasitic relationship. There are some trends that are falling out as we look more into these groups. They seem to be associating mostly with Basidial mycetes. These are the, the actual mushroom forming fungi, um, the ones that you actually get the toadstool from in this group of fungi. Um, this seems to be the most common group that uh, these that orchids utilize. And even more so, we're finding a lot of them are falling in this Rhizoctonia tribe and even more falling in this very core group called Tilaznella, which we'll talk a little bit about today with our native orchids. So we're getting more resolution as we're, you know, we're sequencing more of these, these fungi. So quick introduction to the, to the project. The goal was to, to look at some of our native orchids um, and some of our orchids that we have here in Southern Florida and try to find out what the mycorrhizal associations are for these orchids. And I have a handful of study sites for the native orchids, so uh, I do a lot of work at Fakahatchee um, Swamp um, here at Corkscrew, as well as on the, where I'm stationed at on, in Miami at Fairchild Garden, where we also have a natural east coast population of the cow horns. So a really, kind of really interesting, different, very different population as we'll see from what we see out here in the cypress swamps. Um, so the idea was to collect roots, collect bark samples, we'll try to sample the fungi in the environment, and, uh, and then, um, this all falls into a larger experiment for my dissertation, a larger, part, a larger project looking at an uh, additional layer of comparison where it just so happens that the cow horn, Certipodium punctatum, and the wild cocoa, Yellowfia lata, have congeneric invasives in the same region. So this made a perfect situation to study um, the comparative um, congeneric study. So it really set up a beautiful system. Um, so basically we're make, taking lemons and making lemonade with these invasives. And, um, so it really adds some really power to, uh, you can tease out a lot of the confounding evolutionary things when you have close relatives like that. But we won't spend too much time on the invasives today. Um, so here's our two certipodiums, the cast of characters. This is the Florida cow horn, or the cigar orchid. This is a Florida native. This is one of our lost orchids, we I like to call them. So these were the ones that were heavily poached in 1800s for the ornamental trade. They were sent up to actually market as disposable house plants went up to the Victorian homes in the Northeast. And you know, some of those, you know, some of those classic photos of those things had to be 150, 200 years old. So it's, it's a really amazing story. Um, and, and they're still poached to the day. I still have individuals that are tagged. I've seen it, big cypress that you know, one day they just ripped off the tree. So it's still a problem. And here's that invasive cousin of his, um, the Brazilian uh, yellow cow horn. Um, we, we think it's uh, Bob Emerton has kind of been tracking the spread of this one since the 70s. Um, we think it was introduced in the horticulture trade, probably, or brought as an ornamental houseplant in escape. It self-fertilizes, so it sends a lot of seeds out. But it is actually invasive. One of my uh, pineland fragments, I monitor this species. We estimate about 60,000 reproducing individuals in a five-acre pine rock fragment. So 
no doubt it's probably changing the composition of the understory and competing for resources. So it's it's plague-like. It's a beautiful plague, but it's still plague-like. And again, both of these associate uh, associate uh, mimic an oil plant which co-occurs with the native plant. Just as our native locust berry, which is a pine rockland endemic. So um, uh, this is our only Mount PPA seed that co-occurs in the same region as um, our native California. And this is Stagmophyllum, um, Stagmophyllum, which is a Brazilian Mount PPAC, which uh, co-occurs co with that. Also, this one is sold as a common uh, ornamental and landscape plant in Miami Day. So again, exacerbating. Uh, and we have the non-native oil bee <laughs> that is from Brazil as well. So we have the whole system <laughs> represented. If you're in invasive ecology, invasion ecology is like <laughs> It's fat catchy. So what's going on here? Um, fat catchy is probably, well, it's one of the largest populations we have naturally. Um, only is about 20 or so individuals to start with. 26. 26 or so. Um, very low natural fruit set. This could be a reason. Uh, one of the possibilities is that obviously the numbers are very low. It's outcrossing. Um, but also, the, this is a cypress dome, cypress swamps. You don't get the Mount PPAC and you don't have the oil plant there. So this population, it's very different than the East Coast population where you have the oil plants and the, uh, the, the pollinator. So um, we kind of think that may be one of the reasons in addition just to, to habitat loss that we see low natural fruits that very few fruits naturally are produced. They can pollinate those, these individuals. Um, and again, they're found on uh, hosts like cypress trees, pond apple, they love Inona, um, and on the knees as well, or the, the stumps after they've been logged there, we're finding uh, plants that volunteer on the stumps. But the population is growing fast. Uh, John is well aware. We've uh, put several, well, a few hundred now, probably. I think. I think we're up to eight hundred. Eight hundred, okay, several hundred um, last year. plants with the help of Atlanta Botanical, of course, and uh, yes. Mike and Dennis and all the great guys at the conservation team. So, good news. We're, we're growing the population back up. Um, here, of course, I know of one individual. Um, you guys have the super ghost, but I call this the super cow horn. This thing is a monster. It looks like a palm tree in this cypress, in a, in a bald cypress. It's near the amphitheater. If you go towards the end of the amphitheater, look up about 50 feet in one of the cypresses, it'll look like oh, there's a palm tree growing in the cypress. And that's one of the cow horns. I was just made aware of it um, just a, like a year or so ago, so this will be a really cool one to monitor. Um, I don't think I'm going to like groups, so. <laughs> unless I get Dennis to climb the tree. Or um, again, at Fairchild, very different. We find very different on lifestyle, on life history. So this is our urban population. We have about 32 adult individuals there. Again, we're, we're working on population genetics. We just developed markers, microsatellite markers. So we're actually going to find out what's the origin of, hopefully, of the, the Fakachi versus the uh, East Coast populations to see, you know, what's the deal? Did they come up from Cuba? Are they blown over from Fakachi? Um, but again, relative to the uh, natural areas, fruit sets insane. Um, both citrus bees, both oil bees are present, and we have lots of oil plants in the Botanic Garden, including our native oil plant. Um, to put it in perspective, I think natural fruit set was just a couple fruit. In fact, Hatchie, I have one plant at the garden with 32 fruit, 32 fruits. So um, times that by 3 million, that's about 90 million seeds just on one plant. So needless to say, we see lots of volunteers around the garden, particularly on live oaks and buttonwoods. Very different host plant. So um, this is a good place to start to look for the mycorrhizal fungi needed for germination, and that's what we're going to do. Uh, the, other, the other species, again, the wild cocoa, Eulofialta, which is a very important population here. Uh, terrestrial orchid, it's not epiphytic like the other one. Um, and this one's found uh, distributed both in Africa and the Neotropics. Uh, we don't really know how it got here. Maybe the trade went to visit dust seed. It's not unheard of to think they blew um, over to South America, maybe, and worked their way up on trade winds, or maybe during the slave trade. They, they came over, they, they're found on the west coast of Africa, so we don't really know. Um, but uh, it, it is locally abundant, but it's still considered a rare orchid in the state of Florida. And again, very important population here in uh, um, uh, Panther Range. Very, there's the flower, um, Dr. Luer described it as like a Doberman pincher, I guess, with the ears, I don't know. <laughs> kind, of, kind of cute little way to remember it. Um, getting back to the hydro period, this is the first thing I know. So in 2013, when I first came here, um, this is an individual that I've been monitoring for a couple of years now. It's right on the boardwalk. Um, lots of fruit, very productive individual. Only found one the first year I came, was able to sample this, collect seed. Um, this was following you know, 2012, I guess, so, so most likely it's responding to the previous year's hydro, um, hydrodynamics. Um, only one individual. We only found in total around the, I, I pretty much 
uh, focused our searches around the boardwalk and found about five or six individuals that first year. Came back again in 2013 after I came back from China and inundation, I guess 2013, I guess looking at your guys' uh, um, water tables and uh, water data, that was a good water year. Sure enough, I found twice as many individuals, an adult individual. So here's another adult individual right next to this, this is this same, this same individual. So most likely, you know, they're dropping their leaves or hunkering down in those tough years. And again, further evidence that hydro, hydro period is very important, not just for every ball, your guys' work, but also for, for these orchids, it seems. And may also influence germination. I don't think these guys would like to germinate in water. So all that's um, intrinsically tight. Again, uh, inundated, there's about four to six inches of water. This is near the staff gate in the back. Um, and unfortunately, actually, this individual, someone ripped off both these individuals, ripped the inflorescence off, I noticed. And uh, still, people want to break the orchid flowers off. So, uh, just quickly, there's the invasive congener. You can see in that one pine limb that was infested. You can see Yolofi is actually growing side by side the Brazilian cowhorn. Two different, this one's from China, this one's from Brazil. Most likely, they're utilizing the same mycorrhizal communities. Um, they're tapping into the same networks. So, how do we do this type of work? We collect roots. Um, and we collect soils. And you see uh, some familiar faces out there, the team. You know, that's fortuitous that they're doing these outplantings because these plants are located in very remote areas. I, I would never be able to find them without my and you guys. Um, so I greatly appreciate that. So not only, uh, and then we uh, put out, so we collect root samples, we collect soil samples of the environment. We also put seeds out. We place them in these little nylon mesh bags, um, 50 in each bag, or 50 in each compartment. So thousands of seeds we're, we're trying to monitor um, to find out what uh, fungi they're use, using to germinate the seed. And you can see we put them in all different micro habitats we think the, the, the fungi might be. Um, trees, things like that. And we check them every six months um, and for up to two years. There's some evidence that they'll stay viable for up to two to three years worth of seeds. So what do we do with the root samples? Um, we kind of do two major things. First one is we actually go into the root cells and try to isolate the individual fungi um, and grow them in pure cultures. And then the, what we may miss by through isolation, actually trying to pick out the individual fungi out of the cell, we then just sequence the entire root using fungal primers and try to pick up anything we may have missed. So this is kind of what it looks like inside the root cell. Um, so here is a, uh, so these are the individual fungal pelotons in each root. So we go under the microscope, not a machete, this opposite of a machete. <laughs> Smallest scalpel you can imagine. Um, and we actually pop out an individual peloton. We plate it. In 24 hours, you can see the hyphae begin to sprout out. After about three days, you get you know, lots of branching. And then after about a week or two, you know, you'll actually get a pure culture. And then we can take this to sequencing. These are really valuable. There's an effort now to, uh, since, since these fungi are required for germination, there's an effort by the Smithsonian, which also worked, to, um, to have um, the seed of every orchid and the, the compatible fungi for germination in cryogenics. So that would be go a long way towards the long-term preservation of, of rare orchids. So this is really important to get these pure cultures if we can. Um, again, this is kind of what it looks like. We can move through these rather quickly for time. So we have, uh, we've extracted DNA. How do we identify? Um, well, nice, it's been, a lot of work's been done, particularly with my committee members at the Smithsonian, in developing primers, really good DNA primers that can amplify specifically the fungal DNA. Um, so we use three, I'm, I'm using three primer pairs, a very general one, so this will basically amplify everything but the plant um, genomic material. So we get all the different fungal groups, including things that aren't basidiomycetes. Then we have an orchid fungal primer, which was developed also, which is a little bit more specific. Um, it, it mostly will amplify basidiomycetes, but it does not amplify the telasnel as well. So we have another primer we use, which is very specific just for the telasnellus, that core important group for fungi, or for orchids. And this is what the wild cocoa fungi looks like. So really quick, we'll go through this. We've, we're starting to run some gels. So we can basically see presence or absence of these different fungal groups. So these are protocorms. So this is the, the fungal, the fungi that we're going to find here is most likely the same fungi they're using during germination. So we can, we can, safely say, again, we won't know that until we try to germinate the seed on the fungi, but we can safely say most likely these groups are being used. And you can see with the, with the cow horns in particular, um, they're really not, this, this is dimer primer, this is not DNA. 
Um, they're not using, they're actually just, we're just amplifying to last networks. Again, supporting that idea that this group seems to be really important for orchids worldwide. And uh, this is just a, a better resolution. But you can see um, telazinellus seem to be present in both the invasive as well as the punctatum protocorm. Haven't got protocorms yet for Eulophia alto, the, the native one here, the wild cocoa. We had the flooding, I think my seeds drowned, and then I noticed there was a fire too, so I lost some seeds <laughs> there. So we'll get more seeds out this year. So uh, seedlings, again, we're looking at different life stages. We see that now um, we can see we were, we were just getting the core group of telazinellus to amplify in the, in the protocorms that in the calhorns, um, they're now picking up some other fungi as seedlings. So they're broadening their scope, their breadth of fungal associations. And here are the, the wild cocos here. And you can see the wild cocoa seedlings are actually using two groups as well. Maybe a little, maybe some partial amplification of something in here, but very diverse. So, so this wild cocoa seems to be associating with broader groups of, of fungi. So if we look at adults again, won't spend too much time on this, but again, you can see the yellowfias. This is an invasive, lots of fungi we're finding associated with, with these terrestrial orchids versus punctatum, our native cow horn. You can see fungi is absent even from some of the, uh, the adult individuals. We don't find fungi in the root. So uh, very interesting. Another interesting thing is uh, you can see at the garden, they're, they're picking up uh, this group of orchid, Basidiomycetes fungal groups in the natural population that they're not utilizing in the garden. So we're going to get some sequences back and we'll be able to get better resolution of what's going on. But just from these gels alone, some interesting things are, are, um, are coming to light. So uh, just to round, wrap things up, uh, very early, we're, we're just now getting all the sequence data back, but we're finding that uh, both the native species um, are utilizing mycorrhizal fungi as seedlings in adults, um, as well as we get some protocorm um, sequences back. Uh, both species, uh, again, our native species are still seeing this telasnella group seems to be really important, um, both for germination as well, we suspect, as well as for adult and um, seedlings. Uh, so we were able to isolate, again, the importance of getting those pure cultures. We were able to isolate at least one fungi from all of the species we're studying. Really important. So if those, spe uh, those uh, fungi are indeed capable of germination, that's, that's a really huge step for conservation. Uh, again, that, that native wild cocoa seems to have the highest level of fungi present in the roots. We see this both on the microscope and what we were able to amplify. Um, but they're, they're, in comparison to the, punk, uh, the Cerapodium orchids, the Yolofias use a much broader, it seems like, uh, a grouping of fungi. Again, uh, the cow in the natural areas seem to have greater fungal diversity than the garden population, even though the garden population is, is very productive um, and has lots of volunteers. So there's something interesting going on there. Um, but interesting enough, the punctatum, these epiphytic orchids, it's much harder to culture the fungi. Um, so the fungi seems to be more picky. Uh, we were only able to like, successfully isolate a couple. Uh, pure cultures, so much much harder to grow these these, these groups. Lots of work to be done. Uh, again, the germination trials are in the process now. We're actually trying to grow the seed with the, the fungi. Uh, we're going to continue to to sequence. Hopefully, with the the plan to develop primers, um, then we can go back and revisit our soil and substrate samples. Once we have good primers, we can actually make fungal specific primers for each species. Then we can go back and screen all of our soil and bark samples, different host trees, to see if the fungi is present. This will go a long way to reintroduction efforts. We can also look at uh, maybe how the, the potential for the spread of the invasive conjurer. We can test plots where the, the invasive species is not there presently and see if the fungi there is, you know, seeds blow over, what's the likelihood that they'll germinate. So it's really powerful if we can get some really nice primers developed out of this work as well. Um, and uh, last, we're just gonna, well, we also can glean a lot into epiphytic versus terrestrial. Um, you know, what's going on between Ones that are in the ground that seem to be utilizing a lot of fungi, like the like you may think, you know, the fun, the, the soil environment is much better microhabitat for fungi. So maybe we can tease some uh, actual good strong evidence for that. Um, again, these can all help answer a lot of ecological questions. Again, mycorrhizae is probably one of the most important biotic interactions. Uh, these are this this uh, these interactions are thought to be really um, vulnerable to the climate change. So understanding more about what's going on with the fungal plant community is in the best interest of all, all of science. Very important interaction. Um, again, all this feeds into conservation of, of these rare orchids, particularly here in South Florida. So with that said, um, thank a lot of people, um, some of the faces I recognize, 
And uh, any questions? been new plants showing up all over the place. I don't think it's flooding. You don't? Because, no, because I find it in my yard in the mound where the like, like citrus trees are mm -hmm. and things like that that don't flood. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot more eulopia germinating and growing this year. Wow, wow. Again, that could be, uh, were they adult plants or were they, just, were they small seedlings? Do you? When I noticed them. <laughs> they're, yeah. <laughs> they're already that. Yeah, they look like blades of grass. That's probably a seedling. The eulopia in particular is a fast grower, so that might be a seedling. Um, Again, uh, it may not be the, the adult plants, I think, maybe hunker down and then they get a nice, you know, shot of water and then they'll sprout up. But uh, also those moist, that moist microhabitat is good for fungi. So if it's a wet year, you would think maybe the fungi may be popping That's what I was more, more weather, like yeah. the frequency yeah. of rain yeah. rather yeah. than yeah. flooding. Yeah. Can you explain how the orchid seeds and the fungi come into contact with each other and if it's just a random occurrence? Completely random. So extremely so limiting. Just spore floating hits. More or less, it acts like a spore. Yep, the little dust seed, and it just ha happens to come in contact with the right fungi in the mic and microhabitat. Is the fungus uh, a spore when it comes into contact? So uh, that's a good question. I didn't really, I maybe lost over that. At this point, uh, a lot of times it's still mycelia. So these are saprophytic fungi. So they're just kind of like mycelial mats. A lot of mm -hmm. times, either on the trees or in crevices of the bark. So they're they're not actually producing the fruiting body of the mushroom. So the seed has to land on the fungus? Land on the mycelium. And I know that Rhizoctonia as a general group is mm -hmm. parasitic to a plant pathogenic. Yep, yep, so, so there's... It's a parasite of a parasite. Yep, it's a, para it's a parasite of a parasite, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and Rhizox is a basidium, pretty much, isn't it? Yep, it's yep. Like just being very Yep, yep. Yeah, okay. I just thought there was a comment. Out. The only cow horn orchid I've ever seen in the wild was in a live oak tree in Henry County. In where? In Henry County. Oh, wow. Yeah. Huh, do you think it was naturally? That natural? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there's so many plants that made it out of the Everglades. It was, big, it was in a hidden area, but uh, wow. on the trail, so. Huh, it'd be interesting to maybe get some more to, to check that one. We're looking for different hosts on outside of the, the eastern It was a big county. It was a big one. So that'd be the, that would be the first individual I've known that's not on a cypress or a pond apple in yeah, the West. Very interesting.